G'day again, this is Mr. Thompson, and uh, this is part two of a graphical analysis of your freefall experiment. In the last video, we tabulated our data, uh, calculated averages, and graphed this displacement time graph of, uh, of our data, uh, and resulting in a parabolic uh, trend. And then we linearized that data by graphing displacement versus time squared, and, uh, and we, we came up with this linear graph here, and this trend line here, well, the equation of this trend line here, gave us a slope of 5.0925, um, and we deduced from that that uh, our value for g, acceleration due to gravity, was twice the slope, which was 10.185 meters per second per second, which isn't bad for, a, um, for such a crude experiment. Uh, what we want to do today, or, or right now, is we want to look at... Um, we want to look at the, what's the uncertainty in that value. So 10.185 was our value for G. Plus or minus what? Plus or minus 5? Plus or minus 2? Plus or minus 0 0.001? How accurate can we claim our data to be? All right, so there are two uh, places that we'll get our, or that, that we can consider um, accuracy from or precision from. Um, in fact, uh, one of the thing you'll want, things you'll want to do is do a bit of research or have a discussion with, uh, with your teacher about the difference between accuracy and precision. Um, but where do variances in our data come from? Well, firstly, um, there's a limit to how accurately we can measure height. So um, up here, we've got displacement, uh, S in metres, plus or minus what? Um, now, uh, theoretically, you can be as accurate as half the limit of reading of your tape measure. So if your tape measure measures in millimetres, uh, you could claim that you are accurate to plus or minus half a millimetre. Um, realistically, I don't think you are quite that accurate. Um, and I think our tape measures probably were in centimetres, I can't remember. But, uh, but I would think that you'd be pretty ambitious to claim of an, an accuracy of better than plus or minus half a centimetre. Um, so I'm going to do that. I'm going to say plus or minus 0. Uh, 0, 0, 0.005 meters, so in other words, uh, plus or minus half a centimeter. Uh, that's our measurement accuracy. Now, that is not even going to show up on the graph. Um, that's probably not the most important source of inaccuracy. Uh, probably what's more important is the randomness of our data. So this has got to do with reaction time and uh, how precisely we were able to measure um, the time uh, that it took for our, our rocks to fall. So we've got it, and we can see between all of our different tests that we got slightly different numbers because of that inaccuracy. So we need to quantify that. So what we're going to do is um, calculate uh, our, our delta, our plus or minus value, and the, there's a number of ways of doing this. We could use standard error or twice the standard error, um, but the way the QCAA recommends is that we use the maximum minus the minimum of our range divided by 2. So that's what we're going to do. So here I'll type equals, um, now I'm going to open some brackets, equals max, maximum of what? Uh, maximum of all of these values here. Uh, maximum of those values minus the minimum of all those values. So I'll select them again, minus the minimum of all those values. Okay, close my brackets divide by 2 equals, and there we go. That's my plus or minus value for that for, for, for um, that set of data there. Now I'm going to calculate, use that same calculation for the rest of my data, so I'm just going to grab the autofill handle and drag down like that. Um, so that's my plus or minus value in seconds, in seconds, so that's an absolute delta. Now, they would be useful for putting error bars onto this displacement time graph, but that's not really the, the graph that we, we want the error bars on. We want the error bars on this graph over here, on the linearized data. Um, so we've got to um, use those deltas to create, we, we, we really need plus or minus values for our t squared values. Um, so let's think, how do we do that? Now, um, t squared is just, well, it's t times t, so it's a product of two values. So let's just quickly recap. If we've got a product of two values, what do we, how do we propagate the uncertainty? Um, so let's just say we've got five 
plus or minus 0.4 multiplied by 3 plus or minus 0.2. So you might recall the way that we would do that is we'd say, well, we'd, we'd convert those absolute uncertainties into percentage uncertainties. So, uh, so we'd convert 5 plus or minus 0.4 into 5 plus or minus 8% and 3 plus or minus 0.2 into 3 plus or minus 6.6 .6 repeater percent. Um, once we've done that, we can then multiply the values and we can add the percentage uncertainties. Add the percentage uncertainty. So that would give us 15 plus or minus 14.6%. Then we would have to convert that percentage back into an absolute. So uh, like this, convert it back into an absolute and that would give us 15 plus or minus 2.2. All right, so how do we do this in Excel um, with our delta values here? Uh, my strategy is I need to convert, um, I need to convert these uncertainties here into percent uncertainties, and then I need to, well, I need to double them because I'm adding, um, because I'm multiplying t by itself, I need to add the percentage uncertainty in, in t by uh, to another percentage uncertainty in T, so just double the percentage uncertainty in T, and that will give me my entry for this column here. Um, and then I need to convert my percentage uncertainty in T squared back into my absolute percentage uncertainty, and then I can use those for my error bars. Okay, so one step at a time. First, um, ca converting my absolute uncertainty in T to a percentage. So I'm just going to go equals. Um, so it equals the uncertainty divided by the average, enter. Uh, so that gives me a number. Now I'm going to convert that into a percentage. I'm not going to multiply it by 100%. I'll let Excel do the conversion by just clicking on the percent button. So 0 0.03 compared to 0 0.48 is 6%. So 0 0.03 is 6% of 0 0.08. So I'm going to drag that formula down so that I've got there all my they're, they're now my percent uncertainties for T. Uh, now, I can now calculate my percent uncertainties for T squared by simply doubling this value here. Remember, I'm multi multiplying T by T, so I add the percentage uncertainty to the percentage uncertainty. If I add two of them together, that's doubling, isn't it? So, um, so I'm going to go equals that times 2, enter. Okay, and now that should be a percentage, so I'm going to call that a percentage there. So that's 12%, which is good because it's, it should be, it should be twice that. All right, so then my percentage uncertainties. Now I need to calculate my absolute uncertainties, and the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to go equals, well, 12% of, so multiplied by 0.23 equals. Okay, and that gives me, so, so what that means is these now are my absolute uncertainties for t squared, measured in seconds squared, and I can use them to calculate my error bars. All right, now to add the error bars. So to er add the error bars, I'm going to click on my graph here, I click there, click on the plus, and I want to add error bars. Now, if I click on error bars, it'll add some standard error error bars, which are not the ones that I want, uh, but they're error bars, <laughs> so let, let's use those. Now, you know what? Uh, we, we said our error or our uncertainty in our displacement was plus or minus 0 0.005. Um, so that's, they're gonna be our, in this case, they're gonna be our vertical error bars. So I'm gonna click on my vertical error bar. In fact, let's double click on my vertical error bar. Double click on it. And we get this format error bars window over here. Uh, now making sure that I've got the right hand icon clicked there. Um, I'm going to choose a fixed value for my error bars. So my fixed value, my fixed plus or minus value, is plus or minus 0 0.005. And what we will see is they are so small that you can't even see them. So the error bars just look like they're gone. They're there, but they're so tiny uh, that you can't see them. So, you know, um, normally we wouldn't even bother putting them on there, but I just thought I'd show you so you could see why we don't put those ones on. But uh, every time you've got some data, you'll have to make a decision as to whether those error bars are going to be significant or not, uh, whether they're worth putting on. These ones will be significant. Um, so I'm going to, again, double click on those ones. And uh, now I've got my format error bars. Now, 
I want to use a custom error bar. So I'm going to come right down here to custom and I'm going to click on specify value. Okay, so let me just grab this and bring it up. Well, if I can do that. There we go. My mouse is misbehaving today. Okay, so I've grabbed that and I've brought that up here. Um, now, uh, positive error bar and negative error bar, we're going to use the same value for either. So I'll just click here, delete what's in there. Um, and I'm going to use this column here. My This is my plus or minus value, my absolute, not my percentage, my plus or minus value for T squared. Okay, click down again. Now I'll do the same for this one here. Uh, oh, not that one. These ones here, I want those ones there. Okay. Uh, now again, my my Excel seems to have a bug in it and it doesn't display these. Hopefully your Excel is displaying those values. And there are our plus or minus error bars. So if I click away now, there we go. So we can see the error bars, horizontal error bars. Now, we need to uh, work out the maximum and minimum slope of trend lines that can go through those error bars. Now, I'm told that the uh, data analysis pack for Excel can do this, but we're going to do it uh, a little bit old school. Uh, we're going to assume that you haven't got that uh, analysis pack. And so here's what I'm going to do. Uh, first, um, I'm going to add some more grid lines. So I'm going to click on the graph again, go plus, plus here, and grid lines. I've already got some grid lines, but if I come to this little arrow here, I can put minor grid lines in, and so putting both minor grid lines in. Now you can see I've got much more uh, grid because I'm, I'm going to need those grids because I want to calculate, um, I'm going to put some uh, maximum and minimum slope trend lines in there and I want to be able to calculate the graph using the grid line. So I'll, I want more grids. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut, I'm going to copy and paste that graph. So I'm going to go uh, copy and then I'm going to move over to PowerPoint and I'm going to paste them into Okay, so here I am in uh, PowerPoint. I'm just going to click there, Control, oh, click over here, Control A, and delete all that guff there. And Control V, I'm just going to paste my graph into PowerPoint. Uh, now, the reason I'm using PowerPoint is I find PowerPoint a whole lot easier to draw with than Excel. So um, I'm going to come up here to Home, and I'm going to click on these line, this line button here, and I'm going to draw some lines, and I'm going to draw I'm going to try and draw the lines that are, I'm going to draw the, the line with the steepest gradient that I possibly can that goes through most of the error bars. Okay, now you might argue that it should go through all the error bars. I think you'll find that when you've got real data, uh, it's often very hard or sometimes impossible to get your line of maximum gradient through all of your error bars because they often don't align. So this one here is a bit out of whack. Um, I guess if you have that situation, ideally you should go back and get do more experiments, do get more data points, um, and that will sort of fill out your error bars, I guess. But um, look, what we're going to do here is uh, I'm going to draw a line, the, the steepest line that I can, that goes through most of the error bars. And you see it misses this error bar here, but it does go through all the other error bars. So it... Uh, just uh, shaves the right hand side of that error bar and just shaves the left hand of that error bar so that gives me the steepest line I could possibly have. Uh, let's do that again and this time I'm going to put the line that's got the minimum slope. So I'll do that. Uh, there we go. And again I'm going to use my rule that says I want it to go through most of the error bars. Through there, just tweak it a little bit. Okay. So there we go. So I've got my two lines. Now um, so they're my maximum minimum lines. Now I'll just color code those. Hold on. Okay, so here I am in PowerPoint and I've, hang on, there we go, I've color coded my two lines uh, just so you can easily see um, what they look like. I guess you probably don't have to do that, but I think it helps. Uh, so there's my maximum slope and my minimum slope. All right, now I need to calculate the gradient of those slopes. So what I'm going to do is, hang on a minute, there we go. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look for two points on the graph, two points on the graph that are fairly, well, I want points that are far apart so that it's uh, so that I'm calculating the, the uh, gradient fairly accurately. And 
ones that are fairly easy to read. So I've picked points that the um, where they're fairly easy to read. So it's it's right at the intersection of two lines. And up here, well, it's it's almost right at the intersection of two lines. Um, so they're two good points. So I've so I've calculated the or well, read off the axis, uh, read off the axis, and I've said that that's point one point zero four um, and a y value of six. This one down here has got an x value of 0.16 and a y value of 0.4, read off the, um, just by reading those off the, the axes uh, and working out the scales. And um, so with those two points there, I can calculate the maximum slope. So I can do my rise over run calculations. So my maximum gradient, uh, the gradient on my green line here is 6.36 meters per second per second. Going to do the same for the minimum slope. So again, I've picked uh, two lines uh, or two points um, that I can get a fairly good reading from, and they're far apart, so they're reasonably accurate slope. And I can calculate the minimum slope by using rise over run. So my maximum slope, or so my 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 line of best fit was 5.09. That was my slope for my um, 5.09 for the uh, line of best fit, or my trend line. My maximum slope is 6.36 meters per second squared. My minimum slope is 4.72 meters per second squared. So to calculate my delta value, my plus or minus for my slope, I'm going to use the, uh, the formula, that the, the QCAA preferred formula of max minus min divided by 2. Um, so substitute my, uh, my two, my maximum and my minimum slopes into there and I get a delta, a plus or minus value, of 0 0.82 meters per second squared. So we're almost there. Uh, so you'll remember um, that, the, um, that the slope of our graph was half g. So we had to double our slope. We had to double 5.0925 um, to get our, our gradient. So we also have to double our delta, our plus or minus value. So let's just do that. And we get G is 10.185. That's double our slope of our trend line. Plus or minus two times, because we're doubling everything, two times 0 0.82. Um, so 10.2 plus or minus 1.64. And of course, our rule when we, uh, when we round off our uncertainties is, is we round off to one significant figure and then uh, round, off the, uh, round off the value for G to the same number of decimal places. So here is uh, the final result for our experiment. Uh, we said that G is 10 plus or minus 2 meters per second squared based on the data that we had. Um, and again, fairly crude experiment, so um, a fairly big margin for error, uh, but a pretty good result nonetheless.